Jenkins, come over here. We need to look at the body. Oh, no, 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 no. You see what I see, Constable. I do indeed, sir. And take that glass away. We don't want to get confused with any of the clues. Uh, have you found any clues on the body, Inspector? I've seen more than that. I, I examined the body, and apart from 
blood and bile, nothing did I spot. You need to have a trained police mind, Mr. Forrest. I saw it immediately. What have you spotted, Inspector? Why, the shirt, of course. I see nothing unusual about the shirt. Trained eye, you see, Mr. Porridge. Well, then put me out of my misery immediately. Tell me what is so special about that shirt. Well, the colour, of course. The colour, Inspector? Exactly. I was trying to explain it to the constable while we were driving here. I looked down, and there is on the corpse is the very colour I was trying to explain. What is so special about that colour? Well, it's a very unusual colour. It's the colour of my wife's mother's new curtains. It's a difficult colour to describe. Um, I come in here, and there on the corpse is the very colour I've been trying to describe. Oh, what is it, Mrs. Man, 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 I've got to protest. This constable has got to put a broken glass in the dustbin. It's in the dustbin because it's a broken glass. And it's not white, and I am not going to get into trouble with the law over a because of this constable. I'm afraid that I don't follow you, Mrs. Button. Well, there's bins and there is bins. <laughs> and I've got bins outside the kitchen door to prove it. There's a bin for household rubbish. I've got a bin for waste food, a bin for garden waste, a bin for newspapers, and a bin for glass. And this constable has got to put a piece of broken glass in the household rubbish bin. But it's broken glass. And it's vital evidence. Glass is glass, whatever you call it. And glass does not go in the household waste bin. It goes in the glass bin. And I will not be implicated in law breaking, ma'am. But we are the law, and we're not going to do anything about it. It's been put in the wrong bin, and that's where it's got to stay. Am I to be told that what goes on in my kitchen is to be decided by a constable, ma'am? It can be overlooked. Ma'am, I have never been one to express an opinion in this house. Even if people are getting murdered all over the place. But by laws is by laws. And if by laws get broken, I shall be held responsible. And I am not getting into trouble over a piece of broken glass. It's not merely broken glass, it's vital evidence. I'm afraid I cannot make the constable put the glass in the correct bin, Mrs. Bunn. Oh, well, in that case, I am going to have to tender my resignation. Oh, Mrs. Bunn, this is hardly the time to talk about handing in your notice. Inspector, can't you do something about this? It is your constable. Oh, well, very well, Jenkins. Go and put the broken glass in the right bin. But the broken glass is vital evidence, Inspector. <laughs> in the house always been now, so I retain it as vital evidence. Well, go and get it out again. Oh, no, very well, sir. There. I'm sure that has settled the matter to your satisfaction, Mrs. Buck. I want to hear no more talk of a resignation. No, ma'am. I was merely doing my duty in obeying the law when the police were set on breaking it. Broken glass shouldn't go in any bin, Inspector. It's vital evidence. I thank you, Mr. Porridge, to lead this investigation to me. In what way could broken glass be vital evidence? Because the broken glass may contain evidence that the vicar was poisoned. You may not recognise the obvious when you come from in Germany. As is the rage! But am I right in saying that the vicar died after he drank the glass of wine? Uh, it was not my dandy line of murder, Inspector. It was a little red wine. I bought it from Silver Lake Winery. Yes, it is true. The vicar died after drinking the wine. In that case, he was poisoned by the wine in the bottle. And we still have the bottle and the rest of the wine inside it. Not necessarily, Inspector. But here is the very bottle of wine and here is the very wine inside it. And we'll have it taken away and tested for poison. And you may very well find that there is no poison in it. What do you mean by that? How the hell could the vicar have been poisoned after drinking a glass of wine with no poison in it? Because it may well be that it was the glass itself that was poisoned, the very glass that you ordered to be thrown in the bin, and not the wine itself. Then how could the murderer have known that the vicar was going to pick up that 
particular glass. <laughs> and there are going to die. He's got some wine. Oh, I did. Oh, I see. Well, that throws a completely different light over the whole murder. Well, I didn't murder the vicar. Why would I want to murder the vicar? Um, I don't wish to throw a spanner in the works, especially as the inspector's already accused me of introducing red herrings. But the vicar did criticise your singing during the choir's rendition of Love Bade Me Welcome, yet my soul grew back that Sunday evening. So this, yes, my voice was affected by a cold that I caught on the broom. But the vicar's remarks were very stinging, and said in front of the whole choir, he described your singing as that of a cold brain choking on a cold flame. <laughs> To be the very reason why anybody would want to murder the vicar. Did he go about saying this to other members of the choir? Oh, certainly not. Geraldine was the only one he's ever had thought to say to that. The evidence becomes murkier and murkier. The broken glass is now in the glass bin, sir. You can't get it out again, Jenkins. It may be vital evidence. But I've just put it in the bin. Don't argue with me, Constable. Now, about your quarrel with the vicar about your singing in the choir. Look, it was no quarrel, Inspector. When one has played the part of the Duchess of Plaza Toro in a three-night amateur dramatic production of the Gondolias, one is hardly likely to be concerned over remarks made over him singing. You really have to keep us here, Inspector. I certainly do have to keep you here. But the vicar was already dead when we got here. We couldn't possibly have anything to do with his murder. Just because you weren't here when the vicar drank the poison doesn't mean to say you didn't murder him. The murderer always returns to the scene of his crime. What reason would we have to kill the vicar? What opportunity would we have to poison this drink? That all remains to be seen. You could have gone into the kitchen whilst Mrs. Bunn was in here. She seemed to be popping in and out all evening and poisoned the, the wine when she wasn't there. But that's my husband just said. Why would we wish to murder the vicar? Ah, you just hit the nail on the head, Mrs. Willoughby. We don't know that the vicar was the intended victim. If your hostess didn't murder the vicar by deliberately giving him the poison wine, then she could have picked up a poison glass intended for another victim. Well, that completely is a false statement. Not at all. You or your husband could have intended to murder you know, each other. I see that a prominent <laughs> private detective, no doubt very familiar with divorce cases, has been invited to this party. I am not that kind of private investigator, Inspector. Well, I have never attempted to murder my wife, and my wife certainly has never attempted to murder me. That all remains to be seen, but you could have been intended as victims in order to cover up the intended murder of the vicar in order to confuse my inquiries. What exactly do you mean by that, Inspector? What I mean he said all different poisons take different times to, to take effect. The vicar may just have been unlucky enough to succumb to that particular crime very quickly. What are you suggesting, Inspector? What I am suggesting is that all the glasses could have been poisoned, regardless of what wine was put in them. Now it's just a matter of time to see which of you will be next. <laughs> Leave your 
down to the kitchen uh, once more and uh, get uh, Mrs. Bun to come in here. <laughs> Sit down. Norman, the kitchen serving is as tasty as they can in the hopes of vomiting up the poison. I don't want vomit walking up my sinks. Get them to vomit in the dustbins. <laughs> they don't give it vomit. Now, Mrs. Buck, you must realise why you are here. Is it got anything to do with your feet? <laughs> what, what do you mean, your feet? That constable, he's been looking at my feet. <laughs> Have you been looking at her feet, constable? I can't specifically say I've been looking at Mrs. Buck's feet. See, he's got all cagey already. Really, really respect my own people like him. People <laughs> like the constable? Yes, he's got a foot fetish. So <laughs> 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 why were you looking at them? You tell me that. Why were you looking at her feet, first of all? I deny looking at Mrs. Bond's feet, sir. Get a search warrant. Search his bedroom. I bet his walls covered with pictures of women's feet. <laughs> <laughs> this is a murder inquiry, Mrs. Bond, not a, a chiropodist convention. Bunyan. That's what what is. That's why I've got big feet. And he has been looking at them. I have not been looking at a bunion, sir. You wait till you get to my age, standing at the sink all day, then betting bunions, then you'll get big feet. Mind you, you poppers have got big feet. I have very dainty feet. This is what my wife's wife first saw of me when she first saw me in the beach in John Tier. Well, you married to someone with a foot fetish. Well, and that's why you won't do anything about him. I have not got a foot fetish. My wife has not got a foot fetish. And her interest in my feet has got nothing to do with this murder inquiry. Then why did you mention it then? I asked the question to this murder inquiry, Mrs. Bun. Now, where were you at the time of the murder? Here. Here? In this room? No, here in this house. How did you know that the vicar had been murdered? Because he was just lying there like he didn't have on his feet sticking out. And you immediately knew that he'd been murdered? No, I thought he was drunk. Mrs. Wentworth said he was murdered. For all I knew, he could have had a heart attack. But, uh, where's that doctor, Constable? He's in the lift, sir. What's he doing in there? We need him here to examine the body, not in a lift. He's stuck in the lift between the third and the fourth floor of the police headquarters, sir. The chief constable and the chairman of the watch committee are stuck in the lift with him. Well, get someone to get them out immediately. The fourth of engineers on his way. The doctor will be here soon. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, the engineers are from Shanghai, sir. <laughs> now, Mrs. Bun. Well, perhaps 
Francis says it would be a woman. Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Precisely what do you mean by that? I mean, you might stay away from a pretty little woman vicar, but you wouldn't <laughs> stay away from a boring late vicar. That's the third offensive allusion you've made towards me. First, you suggested that people would say nasty things about when I'm dead. You said I snore. And now you imply that I get aroused by lady vicars. I'm not deaf and blind, you know. Oh, by the way, what did you mean when you told that German detective you wanted to get his phone number? He's not German. He's from Stretchwick Holstein. But why did I ask for his telephone number? You pounced on him the moment he arrived. You demanded his phone number. You spoke very knowingly of him, spying on husbands, and taking, what was that word you used? Perfect. That would be perfect photographs. I'm sure I don't know such a thing. Don't remember? Well, you have a very selective memory. I say something you don't approve of, you remember that forever. And don't speak to me for weeks. Now, uh, it runs in your family. What exactly do you mean by that? Your mother. You're a clone of your mother. You leave my mother out of this. I'd like to leave your mother on early, especially Christmas Day. <laughs> <laughs> the mausoleum was sitting on Perry the house. How dare you research my mother's taste? Taste? Your mother has no taste. Her hair style's right out of the 17th century. <laughs> she made a stand to sing to the National Anthem before the Christmas speech on the Buckingham Palace, and then they just pull up those Christmas crackers and jump up and down like bloody three-year-olds. My mother makes a special trip to Sheep Republic for those crackers. That's very expensive. Then I rest my face on her level of taste. Speaking of detectives, I'm not sure that I couldn't get Mr. Porridge the reason to investigate. Investigate? Investigate me, you mean? What the hell is there to investigate about me? Caroline Fillmore, who works with you for a start. Oh, not Caroline Fillmore again. What is this insane jealousy you have about Caroline Fillmore? <laughs> hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. So I'm scorned now, am I? <laughs> You've admitted it at last. <laughs> Out in our heads. 
Ah, uh, the little grey cells, Inspector. Mr. Porridge said that raised the possibility that the glasses were poisoned and not the wine. That is not the way a police mind works. Then why allow us to panic if you knew that the glasses were not poisoned? There's a lot of method in police madness, Miss Paypole. Something an untrained mind may not appreciate. But you still let us panic and pour all that red tea down our throat. Ah, but did you all panic? The murderer knew that the other glasses weren't poisoned and didn't need to drink them to tea. Which one of you didn't drink the Lap Song Souchon tea? You, Inspector. I mean, you and your constable. No one could suggest a thing heard of the vicar. The trained grey cells of an eminent detective. Never, and I repeat, never rule out any suspect. You are here again. You cannot be ruled out as a murderer. Now look here, Porridge. We weren't even here when the vicar was murdered. Well, neither were Mr. and Mrs. Winnipeg. Neither was I. But none of us can be ruled out as suspects. But we're the police. The police never do anything wrong. You, you've never heard of a policeman being found guilty of anything. It's you not who do all the wrong. Then on your assumption that absence equals innocence and that only those who were present at the scene of a crime could have committed the murder, that puts it down to Mrs. Wentworth, uh, Miss Maple, and Mrs. Bunn. But we didn't even know it until then until you told us. And I didn't even know until Mrs. Wentworth told me. We had no cause to, to suspect that the vicar was dead, yet you came into the house, Mr. Porridge, and immediately assumed he is dead. Well, naturally, not being a resident of this village, I'm not accustomed to see vicars lying on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> But you have a point, though, Porridge. Five people in the house before you arrived, all thinking that the vicar was merely drunk. You immediately suspected that he'd been murdered. Which assumption, Inspector? I think circumstances have proven that I was correct. I don't think this is getting us anywhere. The ruthless police efficiency is taking us forward. The, the, the answer? To any crime is motive. Without that, there is no crime. Find the motive and you'll find the criminal. So, let us start at the beginning. Mrs. Wentworth decided to have a drinks party, and on this occasion, she decided to invite her vicar. I always invite the vicar. Another unusual occurrence is that. And um, on this occasion, Mrs. Wentworth, who usually serves her home red wines, decided to, to purchase, purchase a red wine from the local winery. Yes, it was on special offer. I had hoped to serve my tea from Walter Bay, but it wasn't ready to be handed. Then you proceeded to offer the vicar the red wine and not your homemade wines. Yes, he'd already refused and further, for which I am noted. May be a more suitable word, this is Mr. Wentworth, because as he lifted your glass to his lips, he leapt from life into death. Oh, can't we put a sheet over him? Not until the doctor has seen him. Oh, the doctor's still stuck in the lid, sir. Which he had a puncture in supper time. Oh. Just put forward the proposition without a shred of evidence that Mrs. Wentworth murdered the vicar. I put forward a case, but I did not reveal a conclusion. Who else was present when the vicar was murdered? Ah, Mrs. Bunn and Miss Maple. Exactly. But well, we both have no cause to murder the vicar. That is what you say, Miss Maple. The woman police constable, sent to advise the vicar's mother of her son's murder, gleaned some very interesting intelligence, which she immediately communicated to me. Unknown to you all, the vicar had been going through some old church papers and had discovered an old diary belonging to his predecessor. Oh, my mother's dead. How could she possibly have anything to do with the vicar's death? It's not the vicar's death that I was referring to, but your mother's. The diary reveals that on her deathbed, the, the diary, um, the, your mother uh, uh, opened her heart to the, 
Friedman's predecessor, um, about about the fish. The fish wasn't even born then. Your mother this, uh, revealed that at the age of 19, you gave birth to a child. <gasps> the father was a captain in the Salvation Army. No. During your pregnancy, you stayed at a boarding house in Rayon when everybody thought that you were at college studying analytical chemistry. Your mother never forgave herself for giving away her only grandchild. What are you saying, Inspector? What I am saying is Miss Maple has kept her secret hidden all these years. The vicar had unearthed her secret, and now the vicar is dead. Miss Maple, a non-married mother? How appropriate that you have now spoken this. This is fun. Because you also have a reason to want the vicar silenced. Why would I want him silenced? Again, the vicar's mother was the source. The vicar discovered that you had secretly changed your allegiance from the Anglican Church and, being a fan of both Tom Cruise and John Travolta, <laughs> had become a Scientologist. <laughs> was going to denounce you the next sermon. And the mother told you what the vicar was about to do. I will have the important incentive for murder. Oh, you can shut up. <laughs> and then it brings us to you, Mr. Borridge. During the course of the evening, I've had some inquiries made at a grave where you can stay. Yes, and very comfortable it is there, too. I met Major and Mrs. Hawkins in Greece, and they extended an invitation for me to stay at the grave. But that was three years ago, Mr. Horrid. I understand you contacted them exactly three weeks ago while you were on a cruise ship with Mrs. Wentworth. Oh, we were not on the cruise line together, Inspector. We were just there because we happened to be there together. I mean, not together, but we were just on the liner there together, in the same boat, together, not together. <laughs> I think the more you say, the more incriminating it becomes. When Mrs. Wentworth had mentioned that she lived in the village, I merely said that by coincidence, I just accepted an invitation to stay at the brain. Yes, everything is exactly as Mr. Forrest said. When I found out he was coming here to the village, I had to invite him to see him. And he knew that the vicar had also been invited? Yes, when I called him, I mentioned it would be the vicar and a few neighbours. Neighbours, yes, no willies. Who jumped at the chance of drinking the delicious dandelion and bird of wine with the vicar? Jumped? Jumped is not the exact word I would use in relation to drinking dandelion and bird up with the vicar. Or anybody else. Did everybody seem willing to drink with the vicar on this particular fateful evening? Yet, by the time you'd all arrived, the vicar was already dead. Yet, he was still alive when. You'll have to talk amongst yourself for a minute. This is my wife on the phone. It must be urgent. Hello, Lynn? Yes, dear? No! I don't believe it! I won't stand for it! I'll go with it instantly! Guns and all, we'll leave it at once! Get on the radio and get three podcasts to get me rendezvous with us here as soon as possible! There's not a moment to lose! An emergency of the gravest proportions. We leave, and we leave at once. But what about catching a murderer, Inspector? Especially as you claim you are so close. Priorities come to the are a priority over murders, Mr. Forage. But what about the vicar's murder? I mean, he's still lying there. You must have a retired medical quack in the village. Get him to come over here and get him to sign a certificate saying that the vicar died of a heart attack. That's what Mrs. Bunn thought it was when she first saw him dead. What is to say is not the case? Let it be so. It will save a lot of trouble for you, but more importantly, it will save trouble for me. Uh, Inspector, a man has been murdered in my city room. You cannot just walk away from that. I have far bigger fish to fry, madam. That was my wife on the phone. She just finished her aerobics class, having been given a lift by the neighbours, as per usual. And what do you think she found? She parked our car with two wheels on the pavement, and that bloody traffic warden has given us another ticket! <laughs> Bugger your bloody done 
But murder makes the women bleak. I have a far bigger problem than that. I have a row of traffic board and envelopes. Like a nice glass of red wine. 